Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would like to now turn the meeting over to your moderator today, Elaine Graves, Director at Canadian Foundation for the Healthcare Improvement. You may begin. Thank you so much and welcome everyone to this Spotlight Series webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, I think the technology is giving us a little bit of um, a little bit of trouble despite lots of efforts. I'm not able to get my um, my webcam working, but our, our our presenters are and that's the important thing. I'm really pleased to see so many participants joining us um, from across the country today. And if you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself and let us know um, where you're joining us from, please um, use the chat box. It's, it's really nice to see who's with us and where you are. So as the operator mentioned, my name is Alain Graves, and I'm a member of the programs team here at CFHI, and it's my pleasure to host this discussion today. Before we meet our panelists, I would like to gratefully acknowledge that the land on which I live and work and from which I join you today is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Just a few logistics before we start. Um, as we have so many participants joining us today, your lines are muted and the chat box is available for your questions and comments. We'll be monitoring the chat to make sure that we address as many questions as possible and discuss as many themes as our time together today allows. So with that, let's get started. Just a few words of introduction about the initiative. Um, developed as a response to COVID-19, the innovation in the spotlight today is the Virtual Triage and Assessment Center, or VTAC, in Renfrew County. And for those who may not be familiar with Ontario's geography, Renfrew County is just west of Ottawa, and it's quite um, unique in terms of its um, suburban and rural mix. The initiative was conceived, developed, and implemented in just 12 days. It's a wonderful example of rapid cycle system improvement and collaboration of an unprecedented scale and speed. VTAC supports assessments and testing for COVID-19. It reduces the incidence of unnecessary or avoidable hospital visits, particularly for individuals without a family doctor or for those who can't access their family doctor. And it reduces 911 paramedic service utilization, including transport to hospital. As we'll hear, um, in just a few months, there have been many thousand patient visits, and the early analysis indicates that over half of the assessments would likely have resulted in a patient going to the eMERGE if the v if VTAC had not been available. So our discussion today will dive deeper into how this innovative and impactful program was developed, how it functions, what it's like to use the service, and the results for patients and providers in Renfrew County. Our thanks to our panel members today for sharing your innovation, your time, your expertise, and your experience with all of us. Our panel today um, consists of Eric Hanna, who is the President and CEO of Arnprior Regional Health. Eric's role with VTAC is the Finance and Logistical Coordinator. Karen Simpson, who is the Executive Director of the Arnprior and District Family Health Team and the VTAC Administrative Coordinator. Melinda Rissa, who has utilized the VTAC service and who, through her role as the team leader for the Renfrew County Mobile Geriatric Day Hospital, ensures that seniors who are served by that program are aware of the service. Dr. Jonathan Fitzsimmons, who is the Chief of Medicine at Arnprior Regional Health and the VTAC Clinical Coordinator, and Michael Nolan, who is the Chief of the Renfrew County Paramedic Service. So with those introductions, I'd like to turn first to Eric. Uh, just to ask you to set the stage for us, share a little bit about the genesis of the program, what specific need is it meeting in Renfrew County during the pandemic, and a little bit about how the partnerships and the advisory mecha mechanisms were developed. Over to you, Eric. Okay. Thanks, Ellen. Um, if we can, maybe I'll go to the, uh, the next uh, slide that is there. Um, so I think what's, in, what's important to, to notice, I guess, is a number of uh, partners, but I, I, I want to start by a little story in saying that what happened was back in, um, in March uh, when a call came out and said uh, the provincial government was looking for testing centers, and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity. I'll, um, I'll start drafting up an approach to creating a testing center. 
um, had uh, submitted this in to uh, a couple of people in the Ontario Ministry of Health, and I re recall getting a call back from somebody and said, that's not very innovative. Um, we're not just looking for these traditional walk-in centers. We need you to consider something that was uh, more virtual. Uh, at which point in time, I said this is significantly beyond my capacity, and uh, started to reach out to a number of people then to saying, uh, we, we have a, a, a great opportunity here to collaborate with a number of people and create a more robust program. So the, the initial people uh, that we contracted with are on, the, uh, for, on this page right now, and you can see that there were a number of hospitals across Renfrew County. In addition, uh, we uh, reached out to um, the uh, primary care group in, in Arnprior, significant involvement from the public health and as well from the uh, Arnprior District Family Health Team. We in, in Renfrew County have also been working very closely with the paramedic services over the years in initiatives such as the rural health hubs or health links, et cetera. But, but many of these new uh, partnerships uh, were new and in fact took a little bit of time to, uh, uh, to figure out what everybody's role could be. Um, as, as you mentioned at the very beginning, Alan, what was, was very interesting was that um, from the time that we sort of came up with this idea uh, and actually hitting the ground, it was, uh, was less than uh, 12 days. And I think what you're going to hear from the balance of the par our partners going forward was it was a little bit of trial and tribulations and an ongoing focus on continuous improvement. You're, you're, the, the purpose of this group, though, was to, to say it needed to be more than just testing. We needed to step back and saying in the, in the period of COVID, what could we be doing to help reduce the demands on hospitals? Why is it are so many people using the emergency department? Why is it that we maybe have unnecessary admissions to the hospitals? And then from there, one of the targeted audiences that we identified were the significant number of people in Renfrew County who don't have access to a primary care physician. And we started to focus upon that as well. So it broadened quite a bit from just being a testing center to being one that was going to provide some type of short-term intervention to prevent somebody from going to the hospital unnecessarily. And during that time, on the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, you can see how it's evolved from being just five individual organizations uh, to a, a consortium of making sure that we can connect amongst uh, the entire healthcare system across the, across the region. And as I said, uh, this has evolved over a period of time. We have uh, weekly uh, teleconference calls, and Jonathan, who is, who is chairing the committee, he would, would note and say, oh, I guess next time we better make sure we invite somebody from, uh, for example, the, uh, the pharmacy sector. And then we have another meeting, and another problem will come up with respect to uh, avoidable hospital admissions, and, and then we would identify another sector. So this, this picture that is here right now is where we are right now, um, but it was an evolution um, as we continue to have a better understanding of the population that we were treating. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and just in terms of the background because we're going to get into some of the specifics about how and why it evolved into this uh, more complicated model that's in front of you. No, th thanks, Eric. That's a, that's a really nice, um, a nice setting of the stage and I think highlights the um, the, the levels of clinical service that are involved in, in meeting people's needs. And it's a really, it's a really nice segue, um, Jonathan. I'll go to you next just, you know, to, to share your insights about how um, the clinical pathways were developed, how they operate, um, and how the layers of, um, of care for people um, have been made available and have been added uh, to, um, uh, to what VTAC can provide. Because this is, this is at its core about patient care. This is a clinical sure. service. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, I think when you look at that slide that, that Eric's put there, you can give the impression of um, you know a really complex beast here, and how is this managed? And to some degrees, it, it is it is a complex beast. You know, we're trying to bring together um, every existing aspect of our our, our current healthcare system, um, and and bring it on board with a, with a new system. So there were elements of it that were highly complex, but if Claire, if you could just go to the next slide. You know, from the patient perspective, um, we actually wanted to keep it really simple. 
So the complexities in the background of just the, of the coordination and bringing all of the different partners on board. But from a patient's point of view, it's really simple. You know, if you have a concern, and the, the first thing you, you should do is call your family doctor, a health concern. And, and then we sort of want to say, but what if you don't have a family doctor or you can't access your family doctor? Because close to a quarter of the population of Renfrew County do not have a family physician and there are no walk-in centres. So that plays into the point that Eric was saying that how do we protect our emergency department and our 911 paramedics and put that sort of uh, that next level in between. So for the patient, if you don't have a family doc or you can't reach your family doc, here's a simple option, call this free phone number. And then we can sort of narrow it down to, to a simple traffic light system. You're going to be given an appointment with a physician who's going to call you back at home, and that doctor will either deal with the issue over the phone, or then we will um, we'll start to introduce some of these layers that you, you mentioned. Um, and those layers sort of start with escalating perhaps to just a video call. So sometimes what can't be done over the telephone can be dealt with sort of one-on-one -on -one with a video call. But the next step up, the next layer, I think really is the key to how this has worked for us. And of all of those coordination factors, it's been the coordination and the cooperation between um, primary care and the community paramedic service, which has been... That's what's been so innovative, um, you know, on a, on a scale and an intensity that we've never done before. You know, I've worked with paramedics before, of course, as a family physician, and we've had projects together before, but nothing on this scale. So that next level, um, when the physician on the phone or the video doesn't feel comfortable dealing with that patient's issue, has been to involve the community paramedics. And so all of the COVID-19 testing in Renfrew County has been done by the community paramedics. If the physician on the telephone with the patient wanted some additional um, physical assessment, vital signs reading, or, or, or a physical examination, a community paramedic can go to the patient's home and do that and have a direct link back to the physician. And I think that is, is the key, that it's all well and good saying you can step up to a community paramedic but it's that direct connection between the paramedic and the family physician, which is um, what, what has just brought the extra level of, uh, of care and ability to, to VTAC. And then the next level is, okay, so we've got a paramedic here at that patient's home. We've got some additional information. The paramedic's talking to the family physician. And in a COVID-19 test has been done. And in many cases, that's sufficient. The, the issue can, can be dealt with at that point. But the next level is that the paramedics can leave behind remote monitoring equipment. So the patient in their home can check their own oxygen levels and blood pressure and other vital signs on a daily basis. And this is logged electronically. And then the, the paramedic desk and one of the VTAC positions can look at a screen and monitor 10, 12, 14 patients we've had regularly who have this remote monitoring equipment at home. And then you get to that sort of final level, okay, we're not comfortable with this, this is more serious, this patient is getting sicker, is getting worse. So we still have that sort of the red box, you can still go to the emergency department or call the 911 paramedic. But what we've been able to do is put in so many different layers in between um, from that initial patient I've got a problem to go to the emergency department, which prior to VTAC, for thousands, tens of thousands of people was their only option. So I think it's the, the layered approach, the different levels that has, has been key to our success and within that the cooperation between paramedics and, uh, and primary care physicians has been, has been absolutely key. Thank, thanks for that uh, very much. It's a, it's a, it's a good um, view from the patient's perspective um, of, um, of, of what the access to care uh, can look like. So I think we'll go next to, um, to Melinda. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, and maybe I could ask you to share a little bit about what it was like to, to access the program. What difference did it make for you? 
Um, and you know, if you've got any thoughts around um, any of your of your program clients that may have used the service and what the impact has been for them. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I'm sorry I'm having difficulty with my video, so I'm just going to use the audio. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank thank you for the opportunity for me to speak on behalf of our older adults in Renfrew County. And so what I would like to access the program for me, as a healthcare professional, I did not have difficulty accessing BTAC. However, for some of my patients, they had difficulty comprehending what BTAC was actually about and how to access it. So I had to be very mindful when I was explaining it to my patients. Um, you know, they're not as familiar with teleconferencing and video conferencing as we are. So I, for um, some of my patients, what I would have to do is I would call VTAC myself and talk to the receptionist, give the patient's name, the health card number, and then advocate for the patient on the non-urgent health issues that uh, they were having. And then what would happen then is the physician would call the patient directly. So it worked better that way for some of my patients who had uh, difficulty comprehending, you know, exactly what does VTAC mean, what is, what is a virtual system. Um, and then some of the examples I have for people who have used the service are, I had a diabetic patient in Renfrew who uh, suspectedly had COVID, so we had sent the community paramedics out through the VTAC system, and so the gentleman was tested. Unfortunately, he was negative. Um, and then this, this second example I have is really interesting. So I had a fella who was traveling in the United States and he came back to Canada right in the thick of COVID. And he had acquired a, uh, an infection in his foot on the way home because he had dropped something on his foot. So his wife called me in a panic and she said, I don't know what to do with him. He doesn't have a family doctor. Um, can your doctor see him? And our doctor wasn't seeing patients in person at that time either. So. I said, well, I'll give you the number for VTAC, call them. So the wife called VTAC and she was so pleased with the service because the physician, he treated him with an antibiotic. Um, the physician also told her how to mark the area of infection and then she'd be able to see if the, uh, um, the treatment was, re if he was responding to treatment. Um, you know, and then also they gave them next steps and indicated, well, you know, if, if this is not working, you still need to have, you still have to come to the emergency department, but, um, you know, there was a couple of reasons why he was reluctant to come to emerge, and one, that he was self-isolating, and then secondly, he was an elderly patient, right? So um, our older population are, were really afraid of the emergency department during COVID, so, um, and then I have other patients that just commonly use the, um, the VTAC for, prescription refills because they don't have family doctors. So it was really um, it was really difficult. It was a difficult time and VTAC was just a godsend. I heard that from um, coworkers. I've actually used VTAC myself. So um, and then for the impact that it has on patients, I feel that um, patients can receive non-urgent health care and it's delivered efficiently, giving our patients peace of mind and also giving them back some control during this pandemic situation, knowing that they have access to urgent and non-urgent health care 24-7. Um, and it all, I also like to remind my patients that our emergency departments are still there, and they're safe, and they continue to access them for urgent care, but we have, we're lucky, lucky that we have VTAC for non-urgent care. Thank you very much for that. I, I, it's a very, um, very, patient-focused um, summary of, of, what it, of what it's like to, um, to not know where to turn, to be afraid to use the system or, or to have a system that's not there for you. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, a really, a really nice grounding in, um, in what it is that VTAC does uh, for, for the residents of, um, of Renfrew County. Mike, I think we'll. I think we've got your audio now, so we'll go to you next. Um, and maybe if you can just um, talk to us a little bit about um, the the partnership with the paramedic service, um, how it's involved, how it's being utilized, and um, what what the service is doing, and and what the frontline paramedics are saying about working in the VTAC model. Great, thank you, Elaine. Um, uh, I think, you know, this has been an unprecedented time, I think, you know, uh, whether you're a patient, whether you're a paramedic or uh, involved in the healthcare system, but 
you know, to, to Eric's point uh, earlier and Jonathan, uh, you know, we were able to stand on the shoulders of our pre-existing relationships uh, with the Armpire Hospital, Family Health Team, and, and the group of clinicians that uh, we now are very well integrated with. But we're also able to stand on the shoulders clinically to be able to um, expand and in some ways tailor the offering of community paramedicine in, in the time of COVID. And, um, and Elan, you talked a bit about rapid cycle uh, system improvement. And, and uh, Eric said it took 12 days to get going. And I think about every 12 days, we've had to tweak and tweak and evaluate and learn and tweak. Uh, and there are many reasons from that. We all remember at one time you had to have been in Wuhan province uh, with symptoms. And in those days, paramedics were going door to door to people's homes that met very stringent criteria. Uh, so as to keep them at home, keep them out of the emergency department, keep them from calling 911 and protecting those valuable services. And from there, with the, with the uh, efforts of the group, uh, and on the slide you saw previously uh, from Eric, uh, that coordination of disparate services finally coming together uh, to be able to kind of stay on point and solve this problem, which is how do we protect emergency departments and paramedic resources? How do we ensure that no one is suffering in silence? And I think that that's a very important point because we saw many emergency departments say, hey, you know, come on in. You know, we're open for business. And there was a lot of trepidation from the general public in terms of an unwillingness to leave their home uh, in the early days of the uh, pandemic. So by standing up a 1-800 number with qualified medical receptionists and having 24-7 access to primary care physicians, same day access uh, was absolutely uh, monumental in terms of uh, access to health services. Where the paramedics layered in was being able to work very collaboratively with the primary care physician to identify people uh, who were not able to be reconciled over the phone or perhaps needed uh, someone to have a listen to their chest, to have a close look at them to decide sick, not sick, to decide uh, whether they needed to be in hospital or whether we could offer them something different at home. And at the same time, there was a lot of concern, and there still is to a degree, about PPE management. So by being able to centralize the clinical resources of community paramedics, who at the time were one of the few, if not the only, clinicians going into people's homes, managing PPE, rationalizing PPE, but also being able to do swabs, do clinical assessments, collaborate with the primary care physician, we had a significant impact in reduction to 911 calls, to emergency department visits, repeat visits, and I'm sure admissions. When we look at the additional offerings, um, we also provide uh, remote patient monitoring. So if we did identify somebody who was a bit on the bubble as to whether they could be staying home or whether they need to go to hospital, we enrolled them in our remote patient monitoring program and had 24-7 surveillance in terms of their um, vital statistics, and in doing that, we were then able to score them using a number of different instruments and report that back up through the primary care team so that we had good continuity of care. Other groups came to the table, such as mental health, and I think one of the, one of the crowning achievements of this was bringing together the palliative care community. And the community paramedics have worked very closely with the palliative care community to be able to keep people at home at a time of uncertainty and at a time when access to care uh, has been quite variable over the last five to six months. So the paramedics continue in these roles and additionally do drive-through swabbing, uh, do congregate care swabbing as well since we moved into some of the targeted or asymptomatic populations. And the community paramedics uh, are now also pivoting toward school opening and uh, vulnerable populations. So uh, I'll leave it there for now. If there are any further questions, I'll be happy to answer. Oh, thanks for that um, comprehensive view. I, um, you know, it, it really, um, it really speaks to the the tremendous example that that this project is of cross sector collaboration and of using all of the resources um, to the to the to their fullest extent uh, to meet as as many and and as many evolving needs as possible. Um, because I, you know, I, I think probably you're still on that every 12 day cycle of um, uh, of the evolution, uh, the, the evolution of need. 
Um, a reminder to folks that the chat box is there for your questions. Um, if there are questions that are coming up, there's things that you want to know a little bit more about, um, uh, please um, uh, bring them forward and we'll, um, we'll, we'll note them and we'll follow the themes um, and we can loop back with our, um, uh, with our panelists uh, as the questions come forward. I'd like to go um, to Karen now. Um, Karen, you know, as I was mentioning, this is a tremendous example of cross-sector collaboration. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to um, to the engagement of community hospitals, um, of um, of your family health team, and perhaps others, um, and and how the model is funded. Um, so that we have an understanding kind of um, who's involved, who's paying the bills, um, and, um, and, and how hospitals um, and primary care are involved in the model. Yeah, absolutely, Yolanda. Thanks very much. Um, so I just want to highlight that, you know, over the years, uh, my experience in healthcare has been that the sectors, despite lots of efforts, to have uh, good collaboration and connection, the sectors still tend to be fairly siloed. And I think with VTAC, what we've been able to do because of sort of the pandemic and the crisis surrounding that is really demonstrate how much stronger we are when we all work together. So when I talk about primary care, I mean, yes, our family health team has been very involved, but so have the other family health teams and community health centers and primary care physician um, or independent offices also have been involved. So when the patient calls or the individual calls VTAC, they call a 1-800 number that 211 donated to us. So that number was donated through 211, so another example of partnership and collaboration. They get a medical receptionist who's trained uh, as a medical receptionist. And that's only been possible because of that partnership with other primary health care teams who've all had staff from within their offices either contribute time or have come on board with VTAC um, to work for us uh, to answer those calls. And that's really critical because those medical receptionists know how to, you know, triage issues. They can, uh, if somebody's looking for information on something, they can help with redirection if it's needed. Um, they know how to document information in the electronic medical record because we are using uh, Telus's uh, PS Suites um, to document all the interactions uh, and schedule the calls. And um, I think as Mike mentioned, uh, the other piece, and Eric, the other piece of this is that we do have a clinical leads table that has expanded uh, over the first few weeks to include all the different sectors. So if we've got somebody calling in crisis because they have a mental health or addictions issue, we have a clean uh, process to actually triage that individual. We have a sort of one number to call depending on whether it's a child or adult. And then the mental health system has agreed to then ensure that that person gets to the right place. Uh, we have the pharmacy lead who's working with us to ensure that you know, we are able to get medication prescriptions filled quickly that, you know, if there's issues to deal with around the palliative uh, care needs of clients that we're able to deal with that. We have home and community care on that table. Uh, there's just a huge range of individuals, the hospitals are at that table, uh, that we can then harness uh, that expertise and that sector to meet those needs that we're identifying through VTAC. We've also had support and collaboration for the, from the non-traditional health sector. Um, so Algonquin College, for example, donated time to help us create our dashboards so that we could track our data. So I think what it demonstrates is that, uh, you know, none of us are able to manage something as significant as this during a time of a pandemic on our own, that the strength comes from working together. And I think that those partnerships will serve us um, as we move ahead in many different ways, not just around the pandemic, but just in delivering a more co cohesive healthcare system uh, to patients generally across Renfrew County. On the funding issue, so we are funded uh, through the Ontario government as a, a, an assessment centre. 
So our physicians are funded through sessional fees uh, through OHIP, and uh, then we are funded uh, through the Ontario government to uh, operate as an assessment center. So uh, that's the process at this point in time. Um, Prior Regional Health is the uh, funder, the, the, uh, the paymaster, I guess is the right word. Um, and so they would receive the funding from the government and then uh, all of us provide invoices to uh, on Prior Regional Health for the uh, costs incurred. But on that note, I do want to also flag that there is a lot of in-kind contributions happening. So, you know, obviously the phone number, but we also have my time. Uh, I know Mike at the paramedic service, there's a lot of in-kind time being contributed to this program. And I think that's because we all see the benefit, we all see the need, and we all see um, that we're much stronger by working together and, uh, you know, trying to contribute what we can based on the resources we have available. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for that. It, it underscores that it, it takes the army of, of the many. Uh, there's a couple of questions I think we'll go to um, coming through the chat box and then we'll, we'll go back maybe a little bit to, um, to a little deeper dive on the data. Um, there's a question around how, um, how the quality uh, assurance is done. Um, so maybe I'll we'll go to Jonathan around that first and then maybe to, to Mike um, after Jonathan's had a chance to comment. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's a website that we set up right at the start which has two, um, two aspects to it. One is a, a public facing part which provides uh, information to anyone um, accessing the site. Um, but then there's a, a secure aspect uh, which all of our physicians and receptionists uh, have access to. Um, and that includes um, a whole series of sort of protocol and guidance documents, uh, particularly for the physicians, um, you know, the, the, the what to do um, from, from the very start of an encounter through, through to using the EMR and then finishing the sort of uh, the documentation. Um, so we, we have very clear protocols of, um, of, of how the system should work. Um, and all of our physicians uh, who, who work with VTAC have, have had um, have access to the, to, to the documents, but have also we've had conversations and uh, video training sessions for all of the physicians. Um, but in terms of the retrospective sort of review of what we're doing, um, we have um, uh, regular looks at um, uh, at some of the appointments. So uh, one of the roles that I had with one of our nurse practitioners who was working with uh, with, with BTAC um, was to actually just take um, to take isolated cases and review what was happening with, uh, with with those cases and go through the chart entry. Um, and then in a similar vein, I do I've been doing something similar with uh, one of the paramedic team um, to look at the uh, to look at a, a number of the cases that they've seen in the community. Um, and to make sure that we're following the right pathways, we are following our protocols. Um, so, you know, the the review of the of the clinical practice is um, is done that way. But in terms of uh, reviewing the the processes and the pathways, um, that that's very much um, uh, very much part of the uh, the evaluation of the data. Uh, and looking at how quickly we can have patients accessing us, how long they have to wait on the phone to call us. Um, we every day look at whether patients are having to wait what we deem to be an unacceptable amount of time to get to get a call back from a physician, and that varies depending on the day and, and the time of day. Um, so there's some retrospective reviews. There's uh, there's uh, and there's stuff which is happening live to make sure that we're meeting the criteria that we set ourselves. Well, th thanks for that. Um, Mike, I'm uh, wondering if you have any thoughts from the paramedic practice perspective around around this notion of, of the, the quality assurance aspect. And um, I wonder if you could also, there's been a, a, a related question, I, I think, um, around whether or not there have been any additions to the paramedic scope of practice um, that were required um, to provide the VTAC service. Great, thank you for the question. Maybe I'll, I'll start with the first one. I think Jonathan covered well the, the quality assurance and that we basically do a, a round for patients where there's paramedic 
uh, and physician involvement, and I think that that's gone exceptionally well, uh, especially around normalizing language, normalizing approach, and expectations clinically. Um, we have layered in a number of different uh, technologies that Karen and her team uh, brought in, for example, Doxy being a secure video platform that we're using. We had previously used Prehoff uh, within the community paramedic program, so we continued on with that as well as the, the community paramedic remote patient monitoring uh, suite of products as well. Um, and one of the things from, a, from the uh, swabbing side, uh, our staff innovated and developed an e-requisition. So we now have a card swipe for health cards driver's licenses that auto-populate requisitions uh, in the field. Um, when we look at scope of practice issues, um, I, I think it's important to understand whatever the baseline is within your region as to what got added or not. For us, you know, certainly doing, uh, you know, deep nasal pharyngeal swabs wasn't a run-of-the-mill thing for community paramedics, so we did some um, training on the front end related to that, but based on the availability of different types of swabs and swab requirements, there are now seven different uh, modalities that are being used just for swabbing alone uh, that we have to stay on top of with staff. We are already doing urinalysis, uh, strep swabs, uh, we use iStat, do blood draws, uh, point of care uh, swabbing, uh, as well as uh, we're now moving into flu shot season. So. You know, there's, a, there's certainly a bundle of competence there that if we want to have kind of a one-window approach to care, um, it's good to have those tools in the toolbox so that when the primary care physician says, look, here's where we're at right now, here are some of the things that we need to go and sort out, when the paramedic's there, we can, we can uh, basically bring the lab to the home and be able to manage um, the majority of differential diagnoses within the home and then be able to share that information back or do it on an iterative basis uh, going forward. So uh, for us, it wasn't a significant leap from a um, scope of practice perspective, but in other jurisdictions, um, it, it may uh, be a little bit of a ramp up to be able to get them to the point where um, for most CTAS 3, 4, 5, or you know, relatively low acuity patients, that you have what's needed in the home. So we're looking at, at peak flow. Uh, as an example, going forward, coming into uh, respiratory season. Uh, and as well, when we uh, layered in some of the uh, palliative care, we started to carry some different drugs um, for that utilization as well. And that was done in collaboration with the palliative care team that was stood up through the VTAC as well. David, thanks. That's uh, that's a, a really helpful overview. I think um, there's a there's a couple of threads around around technology, um, so I'll try to to pull pull them together um, in terms of the questions in the chat box. Um, you, Mike, you've given us a good overview of the technology that's available um, around uh, in the field to to the paramedic. Um, so there's a, there's a question around um, new software in general for the system. So I don't know, um, Eric um, and or Karen, if um, if there are any, if you can comment on whether you had to add anything um, to your hospital systems or your other systems or, or, or EMRs. Um, and um, and then there's also a, a specific uh, follow-up question around um, the specific technology that's being used for the card readers. Um, so, um, um, Eric, maybe we'll we'll go to you on the on the EMR and the and the the overall software question, and Mike, we'll go back to you around the the card readers. It might be better for me to take that one, Eric. Okay. Sorry yeah. about that. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, yeah, so uh, the EMR that we're using is the EMR actually of our family health team. So it is the TELUS PS suite. Um, and we have a VTAC uh, schedule set up within it and are using that uh, system. So really it didn't actually require any additional software uh, that other than what we already had in place. And as I said, the 211 software, which is using a um, telephony uh, software system called Nice in Contact, which uh, works really, really well. 
uh, and our uh, receptionists can actually answer calls from anywhere in the county so they can work remotely, uh, which also was a big benefit, uh, obviously, during the pandemic. Uh, so they have a computer, they have a headset, they can answer calls, we can see who's in queue, we can get data out of that. Um, it's uh, very simple to use, so that, uh, that really worked well. So uh, we e-fax um, notes to family physicians uh, with our overnight staff because we are 24-7, so overnight they're quieter, so they uh, e-fax all those notes from physicians so family physicians know what's going on with patients that may have been seen through VTAC. Uh, so we, do, we use that uh, system as well. Uh, but I'll turn it to Mike for the, um, for the card reader system because uh, he would know uh, exactly the technology being used for that. Uh, thanks, Karen. Thank you, Lance. So um, I don't have the specific name related to the card reader system, but I'd be more than happy to provide it to the group uh, afterwards. Essentially, what uh, what we did was took a run-of-the-mill swipe, kind of a, an off-the-shelf swipe with a um, with an interface from a software perspective that reads both the health card and the driver's license merges that information because our health cards in Ontario don't have addresses on them, for example, um, but we needed both the health card number uh, and the address to pre-populate the rec because uh, handwriting was becoming a, a point of failure early on in the system around accuracy and as well timeliness. We have our throughput uh, now down to roughly one person per minute per line within our mobile drive-through uh, um, swabbing centers. and. Uh, we do uh, pre-register through the VTAC, but we also have a rule where we don't turn anybody away. So we needed an on-site efficient uh, method by which we could process requisition uh, and be able to move that forward. Uh, the, the base uh, technology that we use is called MAGTEK, M-A-G-T-E-K, uh, but Jeff Dodge, uh, who's a paramedic here uh, and a former software tech, and Wizard uh, put that together for us. So I'd be happy to connect anybody with him uh, as part of that process. Uh, each unit uh, total is less than $500. So it's a very affordable solution to be able to print uh, the requisition, the labels uh, for the envelopes, for the vials, and everything on site. Thanks. Th thanks for that, Mike. Um, I think we'll go now to the, 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 the series of threads in the chat box around um, uh, who is being reached, uh, um, groups of people that are being reached by, um, by the service, and, um, and, and the potential vision uh, for, for the model um, you know, in, in wave two and, and going forward. Um, there's a very interesting question um, from uh, some colleagues in, in um, Nova Scotia uh, asking about whether you're able to, to, um, to speak to whether or not services are being used by folks um, who find themselves um, without permanent housing, the vulnerably housed, um, or, or folks who are in um, shelters fleeing violence. Um, those uh, populations that we um, we sometimes refer to as uh, as vulnerable populations. Jonathan, you want me to take that, or sure. will you? Yeah, I, I can take that, Karen. Okay. Um, that's a great question. I mean, uh, it, it's uh, it's such um, it's such a challenge when you develop a new system to uh, to be accessible to everyone. Um, and it's absolutely been uh, something we've been aiming for. Um, Renfrew County, you know, it is the largest geographic county in Ontario. So 100,000 people, a little over, spread over 7,500 square kilometers. Um, you know, we have five towns, the largest of which has a population of less than 20,000 people. So there is a, a semi-urban a rural and a remote aspect and an indigenous community um, all within Renfrew County. Um, and all of those areas and every uh, district of, um, of every town um, and, and area has, uh, has at some point had, had patients that have utilized VTAC. So we feel like our, our reach has been wide. Um, our net has been pretty much covering the whole of the county. But I think the question about um, vulnerable uh, people who 
struggle to access healthcare is a hugely important one because those people can be in any of those areas I've just mentioned. You know, you can have um, people who are victims of domestic violence uh, in a town or a rural community or a remote community. And, and so those, those specific vulnerable populations um, have always been hard to reach for primary care and health care um, for, for, for homeless people uh, particularly. Do we have an answer to, to that? Have, have we found a solution? Um, honestly, no, we, we, we don't have a complete answer to that. But can any of those people access us? Yes. Are we really well set up to provide acute episodic care? Yes, we are, and, and often in a better way than, than the existing primary care sort of setup. Because here you can call and you will be called back within, usually within a couple of hours, often much sooner than that. So people in those vulnerable um, sectors who need access to a physician quickly, VTAC is, is often very useful for them. The challenge is the follow-up. So if somebody accesses VTAC who hasn't had any access to primary care for years or decades, um, they may have multiple complex issues. And that's where you know, that, that's, uh, that's a limitation of what we're able to provide. Um, VTAC is not a replacement for full-spectrum primary care. We are very good at offering acute episodic care, but when it comes to chronic disease management, health promotion, disease prevention, we're limited in doing that. And this is where we have to have the, um, you know, that, that complicated link table that, that, you know, I use the word complicated, but that, that sort of detailed link table that in, in the slide that Eric showed right at the start of this talk. You know, by having these uh, pathways to, to bring on existing services, so whether it's addiction services or mental health services, whether it's our social work and, and existing community social workers, we now can direct people quickly to existing healthcare services. So those vulnerable populations who may have never accessed services that are already in place because they never had a route into them, now they have a better chance of accessing what is available. Um, so I know that's not a complete answer, but ho hopefully I've, uh, I, I've given some indication of what I think we can do. And it looks like Mike, Mike wants to add to that as well. Sure, thanks, Jonathan. And I think, you know, specifically to Christine's question in the chat box about specific vulnerable populations, um, yes, uh, we have been uh, used by uh, both uh, Homelessness Shelter, uh, the Grind, which is a drop-in uh, program, as well as Bernard McCann Home, which is um, uh, specifically for women's violence transition uh, housing. And we've tailored our programs, for example, with the uh, Women's uh, Violence Transition Housing. We sent in a team of uh, female-only community paramedics to be sensitive uh, in those circumstances. We've also worked very closely with our Indigenous community at the Algonquins of the Quakanagan. Uh, and we also have a francophone population that we have worked with uh, within the county. So by having some nimbleness and flexibility built into the system, uh, we've been able to flex in and out of uh, vulnerable populations. We have done um, comprehensive clinical assessments. We have done swabbing in those locations. We've used those as opportunities to continue to build relationships. We also have a Mennonite community that uh, does not have um, uh, gas-powered vehicles. So we've flexed into that community and provided swabbing specifically within proximity for their horses to be able to access uh, our swabbing um, services within the community. Thanks, Thanks very much uh, for that um, comprehensive summary of, um, of how the service is, is extending as far as it possibly can to meet a, a real um, a, a real tremendous variety of, of need. We've had a, a really active chat box, and, and thank you um, to everyone for, for your thoughts, your questions. We're, we're clearly not going to be able to get to, to everything. I would propose that in the few minutes that we have, um, that we have remaining, 
And maybe we could go to the results slide. Um, and Eric, could I ask you um, just to give us a summary of the results to date? And then in the last few minutes remaining, um, we'll, give, um, we'll, we'll go to each of the panelists um, for just their thoughts on, um, on, on VTAC for, for Wave 2 and, and beyond. Um, so Eric, can I go to you just on, on the results slide? I can, but I, but I appreciate some of the other people uh, jumping in as well. I think the one that's most important to me on the results side is in the top right-hand corner where it talks about, um, you know, I, I started out at the very beginning of saying how many people are, at, are uh, phoning into VTAC uh, that have a primary care physician versus those that don't. And, and you can see that what we've seen across Renfrew County, which was most important to me, Different communities obviously have different uh, levels of access to primary care. Um, having said that, none of the communities that are in that particular slide, and we're only showing some of them, if you go to the actual live website, you will see uh, uh, all the communities that are there. But there's, there's a significant number of people who do not have access to primary care. And one of the things that I've taken away personally is to saying, you know, this virtual access is, is starting to alleviate the, potentially that the shortages that we have in access to primary care. Um, the other thing that I guess that I would uh, make a quick observation of and then maybe turn it over to other people as well, um, the, the, sort of the, uh, the smile I put on my face is when you see down the bottom the calls by time frame, I remember teasing Jonathan um, and Karen earlier on and I said, uh, I said to them, I bet you anything the, big, the greatest number of calls that come in are on Monday. And why do I say that? Having run an emergency department in hospitals for 30 years, what's your busiest day in the emergency department? Monday. Guess when people phone in to VTAC? Monday. Um, so some of the things were not necessarily surprising. Uh, we just shifted the demand, if you will, from a hospital setting to a more appropriate setting. So I'm not too sure if Mike or, uh, would have any other comments on that or Karen, but those were the two that sort of struck me on the, on the data that we were showing here on the dashboard. Yeah, so maybe I'll just jump in quickly and then Mike can speak to the testing, but just on the top left-hand column, it reflects the number of assessments that were done with a patient by our physicians, our primary care physicians. So to date, um, so this was as of last Monday, we have done 10,578 assessments virtually with patients across uh, Renfrew County, individuals across Renfrew County. And we've also done almost 4,000 uh, in-home assessments by paramedics. So, um, so, and some of those are, you know, we've got the same patients who call back a number of times. Others are individual, unique individuals. Uh, and as Eric has said, if you go to our CVTAC website, you can actually see the dashboard and you can see it live. We update it once a week. So I'll just maybe turn it to Mike if you want to speak to the actual swab testing or anything else. Thanks, Karen. I think one of the things that I want to point out is that uh, all of the activity of the community paramedics in this program has been mobile testing. Uh, given the geography that Jonathan spoke to, uh, you know, a population that stretches out of about 7,500 square kilometers, and knowing that we have uh, no public transportation within that area and limited access to primary care, as has already been defined, uh, we very intentionally took a rotating model. So there are sort of natural health hubs across Renfrew County, pockets of communities that may have received services from family health teams, THCs, hospitals. So we targeted those uh, population nodes within the county, uh, and we have a rotating schedule. So the way that it works currently is, for example, Monday morning, uh, the crew is going to be with a truck and a trailer and a tent, We've got some registration staff. We've got some community paramedics who are fully uh, donned in terms of infection control. And uh, people pre-register with VTAC. We put through, as I said previously, about one person per minute per line. And typically now we're running two lines for two hours. We pull up stakes. We move to the next town in the afternoon. The next day, it's a different town again, morning and afternoon. And we do that repetitively through the week to ensure that every part of Renfrew County has reasonable access to swabbing and assessment within the community. All that pre-registration is done through the VTAC, and that's our kind of point at which you can pull people out with their questions, really probe why they want an assessment, maybe move them over to the primary care physician if there's a burning question beyond 
um, getting a swab itself. And that's been a uh, highly valued part of this program in that it truly is customer focused and community centric and sensitive to the needs of many populations within one community, which is in County. Oh, thank, thanks so much for that. Uh, with, the, with the last couple of minutes that we have remaining, um, I want to express my, uh, my gratitude um, to the team uh, who have joined us today to share this tremendous piece of work. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of the, all of the threads in the chat box. Um, but there have been lots of good connections made, and we can continue to connect people um, to answer um, outstanding questions about things like um, uh, triage uh, guidelines and those kinds of things. These are things that we can facilitate sharing on uh, post, post the discussion today. Um, I'd like to go um, just to, to Melinda for the last word. Um, Melinda, um, what, would your, um, what would your hopes be for, um, for, for VTAC in the future? Um, from the perspective of uh, of those who um, who have and will use the service. Hi, thank you. Um, so, I guess because I represent the elder population of Renfrew County, I really hope that this model of care continues um, because I feel that the new model of care makes the experience so different for our senior population, and those are the people that were most vulnerable during this pandemic, right? So they have access to safe health care, and it gives them some control back in a time in their lives when they felt so helpless. So I, I really appreciate the VTAC services. Thank you. Thank you. It's a powerful reminder of um, why we all do what we do uh, every day. Um, so we've reached the end of our time together. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for your questions, for your involvement, for your kind attention. Thanks again to, to the team from Renfrew County. Um, and um, hopefully you can join us for other uh, Spotlight episodes in the future. There is a, a poll on the screen. If you would take uh, just a minute to complete the poll, we use your input um, as we continue to work on these episodes and to structure our content so that it meets your needs. Um, and with that, um, I wish everybody uh, a good Friday afternoon um, and an enjoyable weekend. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.